kick us off and, and to sort of give a, an overview of where we are in terms of national drug policy, it's really my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, the Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, uh, Michael Botticelli. Uh, Deputy Director Botticelli uh, is very well known uh, for his advocacy and policy work, especially in the area of treatment and recovery. Um, he comes from uh, Massachusetts, where he led that effort there to fold in healthcare and mainstream addiction in the healthcare system. Um, he's held numerous posts since then, and, and probably in a few weeks, as the current director uh, 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 transitions to a new position as appointed by the president, we're going to have uh, Deputy Director Botticelli as the acting director. And he will be the first acting director in White House history in the Office of National Drug Control Policy that comes from a treatment, healthcare, demand reduction background primarily. And I think that's a wonderful testament, given that we want to be emphasizing not only supply reduction in law enforcement, but demand reduction and the promise of, of recovery. So it's a wonderful testament to him and his work that, that uh, President Obama will have him in that post. So without further ado, Deputy Director Botticelli, please come up and kick us off. Well, good morning, everybody. It's really a, a pleasure for me uh, to be here today. Um, it's actually a pleasure for any of us who are in the Northeast this winter, too, because it's not uh, uh, snow. And you know, Washington doesn't have the worst winters, but uh, you know, it hasn't been uh, too uh, smooth. And, you know, I really want to thank Kevin and John and Mark and Scott for this invitation. And to be here with Patrick and Dr. Compton is really a, a pleasure for me to, to, to really be here. And, um, yeah, you know, Kevin, thank you for the uh, nice introduction. But, you know, I've also been public about the fact that I've been in recovery for over 25 years. And, you know, that, thank you. Yeah. say that, you know, I'm another bozo on the bus in terms of the growth of recovery. And, you know, um, it's really astounding for me, and I think it's really a testament to the power of what you do on a daily basis, that, you know, 25 years later, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to be the acting director of the Office of National Birth Control Policy, and it's like wild, you know, when I was standing before the judge, uh, you know, uh, uh, who, who said, Michael, you have two choices here. Uh, you know, pick the right one, and I probably made, you know, one of the only really smart decisions in my life in terms of taking those choices. So it's really, I think, a testament to the power of recovery and to the power of the work that you do. And, and I'm really, you know, glad to say that, you know, kind of um, by me being at ONDCP, I think it really is emblematic of the work that we do and kind of the policy position that we take about reframing the issues around uh, substance use as a public health issue that uh, you know, we certainly need uh, to collaborate uh, with our public safety partners, but this is fundamentally uh, a public health and a disease that we need to treat from a public health perspective. So, um, uh, um, so let me tell you a little bit about our office and what it does. So we are actually a component of the executive office of the president. We really actually have two main goals. Um, and one is that we really set and coordinate all of the activities of the federal government as it relates to issues around uh, drug use. So, you know, we work with all of our federal interagency partners in terms of both developing strategies that support the um, uh, support our strategy of reducing drug use and its consequences in the United States. And probably most importantly, we actually have some funding responsibilities. So we look at each agency's budget as it relates to those activities and, and continue to make sure that our federal, uh, that we have a, a federal funding, um, but that it supports the strategy. And if you haven't seen it, you know, and I'll tell you that, you know, uh, I was actually in Massachusetts when uh, uh, the Obama administration released its first uh, drug control strategy, and I got to tell you, uh, it was pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable to have a former police chief saying that we can't arrest our way out of the problem, that we have to deal with this as a public health related issue, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is ONDCP, and it's really remarkable, and I think, you know, by having people like Kevin there, um, who helped really drive the science, and having, you know, the partnership with the National Institute of Drug Abuse, really having a science-based policy was you know, was really amazing in terms of that work that we do. So, so we publish that strategy. You know, it really has, I think, uh, kind of four main goals. You know, as you know, prevent drug use before it ever begins through a wide variety of evidence-based interventions. Expand access to treatment for Americans struggling with addiction. Uh, that we want to make sure that we reform our criminal justice system, that we look at uh, policies that don't uh, rely on incarceration 
for our de facto substance use and mental health disorder treatment in the United States, that we look at every opportunity we can from uh, sentencing to practices of drug courts and others that divert people away from our criminal justice system, um, and that we look at making sure that uh, we have good treatment behind the walls and good reentry services, and that we really support Americans uh, in recovery. Um, and you know, we really want to make sure that we uh, make sure that the voice of people it, uh, of recovery is heard uh, and seen. Um, I think you know, you all know the power of of of, of consumers and the people in recovery have uh, uh, their power in terms of changing public policy and changing the perception that we have. So uh, it really is, again, uh, you know, it coordinates efforts. Uh, we have like 112 action items that we actually hold federal agencies accountable to. Um, and then we also have a number of signature initiatives beyond the strategy, uh, which we'll uh, talk uh, some more about today. Uh, clearly, prescription drug uh, uh, use issues um, have breached you know, epidemic proportions. Uh, in the United States, and uh, uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing these days has been uh, focusing on uh, prescription uh, drug abuse and its consequences here. Clearly, prevention uh, efforts across federal government and drug driving, looking at the magnitude and the impact of drug driving. So, uh, uh, prevention, you know, the way that I talk about this, and Patrick will remember, we had a former uh, Speaker of the House who was from Massachusetts who used to say that all politics was local. Um, and the way that I, we look at it is all prevention is local. You know, that drug use and uh, risk and protective factors differ from community to community to community, and it really takes a community to examine what's the impact on those areas. But also we know that it really needs every stakeholder at a community level pulling together to, to really create resilient communities so that you need coaches and faith leaders and parents and social service providers and law enforcement to really look at embedding and changing the culture of substance use in a given community. Um, we also know, thanks to our partners at NIDA, that uh, we have effective prevention programs. You know, and still, you know, still today, I think about the fact, you know, prevention used to be, you know, we find someone were in recovery who had a really horrible story. We'd send them to a school assembly, <laughs> scare the crap out of kids, and we thought that that was prevention. And that still happens sometimes. And you know, I used to, you know, I worked a lot with our state legislators in Massachusetts to say, look, you know, we really need to make sure we have limited resources, so we really need to make sure that those limited resources are tooled to evidence-based interventions. And again, you know, we have kind of good science. We have the world's leading research institution uh, here um, to really help guide our, our, our way in terms of what we know to be of effective uh, practices. And, and we also know that we need to have good policy too. Oops, this slide's out of order. So, so I'm gonna, I'll come back to marijuana. I don't wanna, <laughs> we changed this because I didn't wanna start with marijuana. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about opioid abuse in the United States. So clearly we have an issue. Um, 6.8 million people in the United States reported current non-medical use of prescription drugs. Um, approximately one in four people who tried an illicit drug for the first time uh, were using prescription drugs uh, non-medically, uh, second only to marijuana in terms of, of that. Uh, I don't need to tell any of you about the impact and the magnitude of drug-related overdoses in the United States that we have here. We have 100 people a day. And I, yeah, I can't, I have a hard time saying that number without being moved by it. We have 100 people a day who are dying of drug-related overdoses. And, you know, and we can, and that's 2010 data. You know, so we're still waiting for uh, data to do that. Many of those, you know, and the majority of those are, 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 are as a result of prescription uh, pain medication. And we know, and you know, the exorbitant cost of, of addiction in general, but particularly around prescription drug use, has both on our health uh, systems and our criminal justice systems. So, you know, uh, uh, overdoses are classified uh, by the National Center for Health Statistics as poisonings, and you'll see the red line in terms of poisonings, and obviously that uptick is being uh, driven uh, uh, by um, uh, drug poisonings and overdoses, and in about 2008, it surpassed motor vehicle fatalities um, as one of the largest causes of injury death here in the United States. It's really uh, remarkable in terms of looking um, at, at these data in terms of what we do. Um, and I, this is again 2010 data, but this looks at the uh, uh, age adjusted rate per 100,000 uh, in the United States, and it clearly helps guide us in terms of looking at kinds of where we need to focus our efforts, but uh, helping to guide kind of state policy and practice change. Uh, we'll talk about kind of Florida in terms of what you've been able to accomplish here in Florida around some of those areas. 
I think this chart is really, really interesting because I think, again, you know, how does science and data really help guide our policy? And, and this chart is a little busy, but what it shows is um, uh, uh, where people got their prescription pain medication. And the first bar is kind of new users. So where do they get it? And that big blue bar is about 70% got it free from friends and relatives, right? Free from friends and relatives. So we'll talk about why they're getting it or why people got an initial prescription for it in, in general. But, but you, know, we, uh, you know, we talk about this as an epidemic of the medicine cabinet, right? So we as Americans have talked to be medication hoarders, right? So we get a prescription, we take three, we stick the 27 that we got in our medicine cabinet for a rainy day, right, to give out to friends and family. And so we know a big diversion point for those, for particularly new users, is coming from medicine cabinets. So lots of anecdotal reports about kids who are going to open houses or visiting their grandparents way too often um, and seeing what they have in their medicine cabinet. So clearly, you know, we have to look at that in terms of availability. But as people progress in their use, as they move from occasional users to more chronic users, they turn to other mechanisms. And that, that kind of orangish bar in the middle represents uh, 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 people getting their prescription from more than one uh, uh, doctor, doctor shoppers. I hate that term, but that's what we'll call it for now. And then the kind of greenish bar is uh, uh, folks who got it uh, and bought it, uh, bought it from a friend or relative, or bought it from the internet, or bought it from a dealer. So clearly, you know, as people are progressing in their frequency of use, they're looking at other alternatives in terms of where they got it. But I think it really helps shape kind of, uh, you know, our plan and what state plans are looking at in terms of how we have to deal with this. So another area of significant concern, and I know um, uh, your Attorney General here, Pam Bondi, has been really uh, um, uh, looking at this issue is around neo neonatal abstinence and the dramatic increase we've seen um, uh, and uh, largely through the, the drug use issue here in terms of the dramatic increase of, of infants who are born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, many of those, um, you know, clearly the cost involved in those is really high. The four out of five uh, newborns in, uh, who had neonatal abstinence system were enrolled in Medicaid, so we know it has a significant implication uh, on our publicly funded uh, medical programs. But it, but it also has challenges relative to our state budget, our capacity um, as um, uh, addiction institutes, and as, as child welfare thinks about this, um, in terms of making sure that we know about this issue, making sure that we know that we're dealing with this issue appropriately, right? So that we're not necessarily stigmatizing uh, uh, women, pregnant women who are using and making sure that they get um, adequate treatment, how we're doing good screening and education within our, uh, um, uh, within our um, uh, women of childbearing age. Um, this has been dramatic in terms of law enforcement's ability to kind of immediately save someone's lives, but it has changed the dynamic in their community with law enforcement and the addiction community. And now people in the addiction community and people who are addicts see law enforcement as part of the solution and not part of the problem. And he tells a story that he said, you know, it used to be us putting on the blue flashing lights and pulling people over. And he tells a story about how now people are pulling them over. So someone was driving behind them, flashing their lights, uh, pulled them over because they knew that the police carried Narcan and they administered Narcan to save someone's life. And so it's really been remarkable. And we've seen that kind of take off across the country uh, now where we have more and more uh, uh, law enforcement agencies who have begun to, to administer naloxone. Uh, so uh, New, York is, New York City is starting a, a pilot program in Staten Island. We have San Diego, Governor Shumlin up in Vermont, who dedicated his entire State of the Union speech around heroin and opioid addiction, is training the entire poli uh, state police force in Vermont to administer naloxone. Um, my, again, you know, my boss, who's a former cop, his words, not mine, says it's cop-proof, right? So uh, many of you know naloxone. It's really pretty safe, non-toxic. It has very little side effects. If you give it to people who are not uh, not using opioids, has little effect on their body. So you know it's a pretty you know it's a pretty benign medication, except when it comes to reversing an overdose, and it's pretty dramatic in terms of what we do. So uh, I want to talk you know if there's kind of you know I think one bright spot um, I'll talk a little bit in terms of again we have our uh, we have our friends at NIDA to thank for this that that we have an ever increasing arsenal around medications that are currently available. Um, so one is about uh, for nicotine use disorder. So I think many of you know uh, that people who have histories of substance use disorders uh, also smoke. And 
I, you know, I don't know if the data has changed uh, with the prescription with the overdose issue, but uh, more people die, more people with histories of substance use disorders die of tobacco-related causes than they do uh, because of their addiction. And I think many of you have been, you know, kind of around for a while. You know, the prevailing thought was if you told people to quit in early recovery, it was going to somehow destabilize their early recovery. And you know, I've been in recovery for a long time, and unfortunately, I have still struggle with my own tobacco. Uh, addiction, but the prevailing thought was, you know, no major changes in your first year. You know, smoke them if you got them. You know, was kind of what people talked about uh, to do that. And we know, you know, quite honestly, that that's proven not to be true. That we actually know that one, that the vast majority of people who are coming into our treatment programs want to quit smoking. We have effective medication, and that actually quitting smoking uh, concurrently with dealing with your substance use issue actually aids in long-term recovery. Right? So you know, we have a kind of perfect storm here of good medications and sound science and practice. So how, and making sure that we're embedding tobacco cessation services in all of our treatment programs is particularly important. We have, um, you know, uh, we've had an arsenal around alcohol use disorder, but I wanna focus mostly on the opioid use disorder medications that we have and something that's particularly important to me. There was actually a good uh, uh, op-ed uh, that came out, at least I saw it yesterday, I know when it came out, uh, uh, looking at the stigma around opioid use medications. And, uh, you know, so these are highly, highly effective medications that we have. When combined with behavioral therapies, they should be our standard of care for people with opioid use disorders. Should be the standard of care for people. Yet much of the consternation, and I've been doing this work for a long time, has come from this treatment field itself in terms of how we think about uh, making sure that clients with opioid use disorders have uh, adequate access uh, to these medications. You know, I know that we have uh, benefits issues around it. I know we have authorization issues around it. But, you know, if I could say, if there is one thing that I think we can do now is making sure that all of our clients who have an opioid use disorder have access to uh, uh, these medications. And that includes making sure that they have adequate access to the full continuum of services that we have for treatment of opioid disorders. And I will use what happened in Massachusetts. So, you know, and I love people who do this work. I love people who do this work. You know, but you know, we had our residential treatment programs that had the laundry list of medications next to the phone, right? So mental health medications, uh, um, uh, uh, opioid use disorder medications. And they would categorically deny people who are on medications access yeah. to those services. Categorically deny, which quite honestly I think is really unethical and I think it's illegal. Um, but, you know, so one of the things that we did is we worked with our providers. We actually changed our licensing regulations to say that you couldn't automatically uh, categorically deny admission to those people who were on uh, uh, prescription uh, medications. And we worked with them to train them. And I've been doing this at work, you know, I always used to say that when our treatment system was focused on alcohol use disorders and then people with drug addiction started coming in, we used to, we used to hear the same thing. It was this chicken little thing like, oh my God, we can't have the drug addicts or the alcoholics because the drug addicts are going to set off the And we hear the same kind of rhetoric sometime around prescription, around uh, uh, opioid use disorder. So I think we need to work, uh, make sure that, that we're doing that. Um, you know, and, and to boot is, there's a, actually a study that came out of Baltimore, Maryland, that when Baltimore increased uh, access to methadone treatment and to buprenorphine treatment, their overdoses, uh, uh, their uh, overdose uh, fatalities uh, uh, were dramatically reduced. So here we have, uh, you know, so we have to make sure that we're doing that. Um, we also want to make sure that we're expanding treatment. And I know states are at different places relative to Medicaid expansion of the ACA. Um, and, you know, Patrick Kennedy knows this best of anyone. You know, but uh, too, uh, too few people are coming into treatment. And we know one of the biggest reasons uh, that uh, uh, presents a barrier for people who are coming into treatment are two reasons. One, lack of insurance that pays for it, and underinsurance that doesn't fully reimburse uh, for substance use disorder services. So, so we want to make sure that, uh, and so we know that Medicaid expansion and ACA, by making sure that they include substance use disorder benefits, by the Mental Health Addiction and Parity Act, by making sure that it ensures uh, are treating uh, uh, substance use disorders the same way they treat other medical disorders, uh, you know, we're hopeful that we can begin to make an increase on the number of people who are uh, accessing uh, treatment. And, and again, I think there's also significant opportunity at the state level to, to look at what your treatment availability is for folks, uh, making sure that they have access to a wide variety of treatment and recovery support services um, and that uh, uh, either 
uh, uh, state programs, Medicaid and insurance, are making sure that they're reimbursing for that. It's, a, it's an area that we need to kind of focus on. Uh, I'm not going to go over this because um, probably Wilson will. Uh, these are, uh, I think, what we know in terms of the uh, you know, principles of effective treatment, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here as it relates to this, but we know that no single treatment is appropriate for anyone, right? So any disorder that we have, we need to make sure that we have a wide variety of appropriate treatments uh, for, uh, for everybody. Um, we need to make sure that we're providing uh, co-occurring uh, services, that many people with substance use disorders also have co-occurring mental health issues. And I, uh, I saw in your program you're having Dr. David Mealy here, who's going to be talking about that, who's you know, one of the national experts in terms of that work. Uh, treatment need to attend to the multiple needs of the individual, not just her substance use disorder. You know, we know that a lot of people need help with stable housing, with employment, uh, with repairing uh, social relationships. Um, and they need to be continually modified uh, around changing needs. Um, I'm not going to go through this, um, uh, um, but uh, let me go back here and finish with uh, talking a little bit about marijuana. You know, and you have um, two folks, and particularly uh, in both Kevin and Patrick Kennedy, who are going to talk, uh, who, who talk about this um, uh, it, um, uh, much more passionately. Um, than, than I do. And I think part of the unfortunate piece around kind of marijuana and uh, uh, marijuana laws has really been kind of the lack of information that's out there in terms of the health impact of marijuana. Um, and it's really unfortunate that, you know, kind of tax revenue has kind of dominated the conversation um, around this issue. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, all you hear is around the, the um, the positive effects of, of marijuana, both medical marijuana and legalized marijuana. Um, and I think that, you know, what what we've been trying to do and other folks who are you know, spending their life's work on this is making sure that people have adequate understanding around the health impact of marijuana. So, you know, we know the numbers of past year users. Um, uh, we know that uh, marijuana use has been associated with uh, uh, addiction, uh, estimated that about one in nine people who use marijuana to go on to develop uh, um, uh, marijuana dependency. If you look at treatment admission programs across the country, uh, around adolescent treatment, you'll find that the vast majority of adolescents who are in treatment are there for, mar uh, uh, for marijuana dependency. But we also know that it has a significant impact on learning and IQ. And so there was a study that showed that for uh, adolescents who started marijuana, um, they have a significant reduction in IQ later in life. You know, again, I don't think this is where we want to be as a country. One of, one of the issues that we were just talking about, and you know, I, I, I worked for over 20 years in the Massachusetts Health Department in a wide variety of capacities. You know, and, and, and if you look at um, kind of uh, industry tactics, whether it's the alcohol industry or the tobacco industry, they are not looking for the occasional user. That's not where they make their money. They're, it's not where they make their money. They make their money on the heavy users, right? So if you look at alcohol, it's estimated that 20% of people drink 80% of the alcohol that we have. Again, they don't want the teetotaler who's going out on a Friday night. They want people to drink more. Tobacco industry wants people to drink more, and they want lifelong loyal customers. And how do they do that? They do that by targeting kids. They do that, and, and for us to think that marijuana is not going to utilize and utilize the same playbook that we did. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin and Patrick taught me this. Yeah. Kevin and Patrick taught me this. You know, but the, but the other thing, too, and that we were talking about, and I think those of us who have been doing public health for a long time also understand the disproportionate health impact. You know, part, part of what legalizers will talk about are the disproportionality in our criminal justice system, which is true, and we need to continue to deal with that. But we also need to understand the disproportionate health impact uh, uh, that these issues have on our poor communities and our communities of color, right? So if you look at any, if you look at alcohol, you will find most often that in poor communities and communities of color, there are inordinate amount of alcohol outlets within those communities. If you think of tobacco, that you know they have done repeatedly, and the alcohol industry repeatedly done target marketing to make sure they are targeting those vulnerable populations. And if we think again that this that these companies are don't understand that and are not going after our most vulnerable people, um, I think you know we're in for a lesson here. 
Um, so, you know, uh, that, you know, that said, um, uh, I think that, you know, that remain, uh, marijuana remains illegal uh, under, under federal law. It remains a Schedule I uh, substance under the uh, FDA. Um, and, uh, you know, we clearly understand the votes in uh, Colorado and Washington in terms of in terms of the impact and the department what the Department of Justice said was not they're not legalizing it. What they're saying and what the Department of Justice said is basically with limited federal resources we are really not going after and we'll continue to not go after largely people who are using marijuana for personal use in the privacy of their own home. And and, and when you think about marijuana, it really hasn't been the federal folks that have stepped in. It's been largely a local law enforcement issue that have dealt with marijuana. So what, what's our role in this? Well, ONDCP feels like it's singularly situated to make sure that we are monitoring the impact of Washington and Colorado in terms of the impact. So we took those eight criteria that the Department of Justice laid out, and we are looking at national, state, and local data around the public safety and public health impact. So we want to make sure that, one, we're providing good information to the Department of Justice around the uh, implementation, but also that we're providing information for other states and locals who can understand. Um, you know, the, there was just the National Governors Association in uh, Washington, and I had the opportunity to meet with uh, uh, Governor Hagenluber from Colorado. And, you know, he's been, um, I think, uh, he's not been in favor of legislation. He has said publicly he wishes Colorado was not the experiment here. And he really cautioned other governors to say, you know, if I were you, I'd really wait and see what happens in Colorado and Washington before I make decisions about what happens. You know, so um, it, it, I think it's challenging for us. I actually find it really, um, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that many, many states are significantly concerned around the prescription drug and heroin issue that we have here, um, but, but simultaneously seem to be going in a different direction around marijuana. And for those folks, many of you have worked with people with addiction for a long, long time, know that people don't start with prescription medications that people start way earlier, often with alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana, often in competition. So, uh, you know, it's, this, it's really weird to me how we can be having these two separate conversations at the same time. And this is where I think we need your help in making sure that people are getting uh, uh, the information around what, what are the health consequences that we have, and really what our fear is around the uh, industry of marijuana. So, uh, with that, I will end. Uh, I probably went over my time, but uh, I have